This afternoon for a little while, I would like for us to study the Bible regarding God's providence and God's miracles. In the process of doing that, we'll be noticing the difference in God's providence and miracles. First of all, I would like to talk about the meaning of the word miracle. There's a modern day meaning of it, and usage of it, and there's a biblical meaning of it. You might hear some people today talk about a miracle drug because of what all it can do that amazes people. Or you might talk about somebody being in a terrible, terrible car accident and it was a miracle that they escaped it. Well, that's a modern usage of it. But when you come across the usage of it in the Bible, it doesn't mean either one of those. A miracle in the Bible is actually a setting aside or altering what is natural law. The easiest way to say that is when Jesus raised Lazarus from the tomb. Or when Jesus was walking on the water. Physical laws made no difference at that time. After all, he who was doing it was the origin of those laws. And he could alter them any way he saw fit to do so. And he did. Miracles are given in the Bible as signs that the person like Jesus was either who he claimed to be or the word being preached that was said to be the word of God and man is subject to it is truly that, the word of God and not the word of men. That's why miracles at times are called signs. They're also called wonders because they would make us wonder at them because they don't happen naturally. So we need to know that about the biblical definition of miracle, and that's the way I'm going to use it, and that's the way most of the time I use it. But there is a modern-day definition, and when you use a dictionary nowadays, you've got to realize they're going to give you a definition of the way that it's used nowadays as well as how it's used anywhere, and it may vary from time to time, place to place. Now, I would like to look at providence a little more than a miracle at this point in our study. Let's define providence. It derives from the Latin providentia. That is, our English word does, which signifies literally foresight. Foresight. Providence is used to denote the biblical concept or idea of wisdom and power, and I'm quoting here, quote, wisdom and power, which God continually exercises in the preservation and government of the world for the ends which he proposes to accomplish, unquote. So say McClendon and Strong in the Encyclopedia of Biblical Ecclesiastical Literature, page 707. Merrill Tenney, in his Pictorial Encyclopedia of the Bible, page 920, had this to say about providence, and I quote again. Providence concerns God's support, care, and supervision of all creation. From the moment of the first creation to all the future into eternity. Now let me pause here and say you can see then how that miraculous things could fit into the providential care of God. But there is a distinction in the way that we made it. So providence stands opposed to what's called deism. Deism is the idea 
that God created all things as we see them and set up all the laws and then shows no interest whatsoever in the running of them. He just backs off and lets it all go. And uh, providence is the opposite of what some people call fate or chance, maybe is a good way to put that. This state of mind sees world events as uncontrollable and without any element of benevolent purpose. Now, as you look at providence, you can break it down for sake of classification into general and special providence. General providence, we would say it's God's promise to provide an environment in which man and beast can live. Genesis 8.22, Moses by inspiration wrote, while the earth remaineth, seed to time and harvest, cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Going from there, and in speaking of the work of Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul wrote, by him, all things consist. Colossians 1, verse 17. And in Athens, as he was preaching, Luke records that Paul declared, In him we live and move and have our being. Acts 17, verse 28. Jesus himself said, as Matthew by inspiration recorded it, He maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Matthew 5.45 That's what we would put as general providence in the daily functioning of this world. But then there's special providence. This is care which God gives to and on behalf of those who seek Him and those who love Him, His children. This is the special providence the way we're using it. Now you may, in reading some commentaries, find that they define special providence to be, be the miraculous, but we're not doing that here. God can get the truth seeker. Maybe this is the best to illustrate it. God can, without a miracle, God can get the truth seeker to gather with the person teaching the truth. Now, wisdom personified declares, I love them that love me, and those that seek me diligently shall find me. Proverbs 8, 17. That can't be true unless God's providence is working for the good of those who seek Him. Now, to show you even more so how that is in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 7, uh, Jesus said, Ask, and it shall be given you Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. I think most of you have heard me point this out about the Greek tenses in this. They're all present tense, which is linear action. It just keeps on going. Therefore, to read this literally, keep on asking and it shall be given you. Keep on seeking and you shall find. Keep on knocking, it shall be opened unto you. It never stops. It's not a one-time action. I wish sometimes the translators had put it in that way. It makes it clearer as to exactly, exactly what was said. There's the persistence and steadfastness in each one of these, asking and seeking and knocking. There's no, well, it didn't answer, I'm leaving. 
It's the idea that I'm not going to stop knocking. I'm not going to stop seeking. And I'm not going to stop asking till I get the answer. And the Lord says, you do that and you'll get the answer. And that's a wonderful thought. Man's expected to look for God. Sometimes we, in emphasizing the obligation the church has under the Great Commission to preach the gospel to every creature, we fail to realize that God has created a world and is in control of it in such a way that he expects men to look for the God who made this world, Acts 17 and verse 27. Paul declared to those heathens in Athens, he's not far from any one of us. And thus we have emphasized greatly how that you can't have a design without a designer who has the capabilities of designing whatever it is. The person who is so void of any sense that they can look at one of these live oaks out front and not see design. There's something wrong there. And if you see design, it didn't design itself. There was a designer behind it with the power to bring it into existence. And that's true of anything. If there's order in anything, then there is a designer behind it because order means there's design. And where there is not a designer, I can tell you exactly what happens. Chaos. That's the reason that in a nation where the laws aren't designed to, for the good of the people, to protect good people from bad people and things like that, and where it all breaks down, then there's chaos. There's trouble. And when you read explicitly in the Word of God, Romans chapter 13, that God meant civil governments to protect good people. And when civil governments fail to do that, well, read your paper, watch the news, look at YouTube, wherever you want to look, the more that kind of chaotic mentality exists to where they're against, watch it. Law and what? Order. Then you can just expect more and more chaos. So man is expected to look for God, according to Acts 17, 27. And God is not far from any man, same verse, same chapter, same book. And then we find the Bible teaching that God wants men to find him, 2 Peter 3, 9, and 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4. So while the church is composed of people who found God, they found the gospel, they learned the gospel, they from the heart obeyed the gospel, the Lord's added them to the church. They're concerned about souls outside of Christ and lost, so they begin to do what they can to learn how to teach and what to teach and to go ahead and seek and save that which was lost, which Jesus said what he came to do. And we continue it as his spiritual body, members of his spiritual body. The ideal is, is that man looking for God and the church taking the gospel, they'll meet. I firmly believe God's providence will cause that to happen where there is one who's hungry and thirsting after righteousness. Where there is one who's asking, seeking, and knocking and won't quit. God is in such control of things without working any miracle. He can bring the two together. Now what's interesting about this is when you look at Philip getting together with the Ethiopian eunuch. Now we have insight into that by the Holy Spirit. And we have the Holy Spirit directly involved in the Bible telling us that he was involved with Philip. Now think about that for a minute. Philip is preaching the gospel and we'd say he's having a great gospel meeting in Samaria. We read about that. And yet God appears to him and says, leave this gospel meeting and go down to Gaza. Now notice how God's providence worked. No miracle here. 
When Philip gets to a certain place in Gaza, who's there doing what? Well, the eunuch is coming back from Jerusalem, gets there right at the right time. He's reading in Isaiah, and Philip hears him. Then he's told, go and join yourself in that chariot. And then it's left up to the preacher Philip to begin at the same scripture and preach unto him Jesus. Now that is one of the ways that Revelation has given us an insight into providence. No indication he spoke to the eunuch. Had him leave. Now you leave Jerusalem at two minutes after 12. And I'll get Philip to leave up here at this particular time. And you all all meet down there. No, that's providence that did that. Tell me why that I shouldn't believe that can happen any time in this world where men are asking and seeking and knocking to learn the truth. They're that intense. They're not going to quit. Well, God knows the minds of all men. He knows their purposes and their hearts. He knows whether they're doing what is said in 7. Notice how he goes ahead, I say verse 7, chapter 7. Notice how he continues to develop that. After he says, ask, it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Notice, for everyone. How many is left out? For everyone that asketh, receiveth. That means for everyone that keeps on asking, what is Jesus promising? He'll receive it. And he that seeketh, if you keep on seeking, you'll find. And if you keep on knocking, it's going to be open. Or what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will give him a serpent? Notice how simply he talks about the providence of God. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good gifts to them that ask him? Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. That's the attitude that ought to be in the mind of the saved member of the church toward those outside of Christ as they seek God. We're preaching the truth, and you never have to worry about it. If one is seeking God and asking for God and looking for the truth and won't quit, I don't mind standing here and saying, I know they will get together with the person teaching the truth. Now, of course, that doesn't mean when they hear the truth, they're going to obey it. Rich young ruler tried that with Jesus and learned by the teaching of Jesus. He just thought he wanted to obey. But that's not the point we're making here. The point we're making is that if you want to find the truth, and you put your all into it and don't stop, God and His providential care can work things where you can get together with the person the truth who has the truth that you need. Now, no, we, we note this, that God can providentially get the truth seeker to the truth. That's the reason Matthew 6, 33 is so important. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. So a host of people aren't going to find because they have other interests. It just comes down to that. They're half-hearted. It, there's no use going up here and trying to get somebody and twist his arm up behind him or her and say, why don't you obey the gospel? You know what the Bible teaches. They don't want to. They're not interested. They got their mind somewhere else. They're not like Matthew 7 and 7. They can be around the truth all day long, every day for years. It's not going to bother them because they don't ask and they don't seek and they don't knock. They go through the motions, but their heart is not in it. Their desire is not there. There's no seeking, a diligent search, a patient inquiry to learn God's will for my life. And when I learn it, do it. It's not there until that can be in a person. Don't expect them to obey the gospel. Oh, they might be coerced into doing something because they know somebody wants them to and to get them off their back, but that's not obedience to the gospel. 
Paul stated to the Philippian Christians in Philippians 4 and verse 19, And my God shall supply every need of yours according to his riches. Do you believe that? It's part of the truth of Jesus Christ concerning faithful Christians. And God shall supply every need of yours according to his riches. We have to say again, he's not saying everything you want, but every real genuine need he will supply according to the riches of God. Now, how rich is God? Under the law of Moses, the Jews were promised, neither shall any man desire thy land when thou goest up to appear before Jehovah thy God three times in the year, Exodus 34, 23. You see, the men were expected on these feast days to go up, all of them, to Jerusalem. That's what's happening on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. What is he saying? All that will be protected when you go up to do what I told you to do. It's not, not anything going to happen to it. I promise you. Now, men might make that promise. I wouldn't put much stock in it. At least certain people. But when I have Old Testament books recording the events such as Joseph, how can you read about Joseph and all that happened to him and not see God's control of things? And then the Holy Spirit, through Joseph, as he's revealed himself to his brothers all those long years later, says, you sold me into slavery and you meant it for evil God worked it for good and he's brought all this together down here in Egypt and all in the process of what he had done years before making a promise to Abraham that in thee all nations of the earth will be blessed and we finished not long ago under the direction of Ken on Wednesday night the study of Esther how can you read Esther and not see God operating there's not a mention of a miracle there as we've defined it and so we're able to see that God is in control. He is in complete control. I don't care what's going on in the Gaza Strip today or somewhere in the world. It doesn't make any difference. God is in ultimate control. He's not bothered by these things. We may be bothered by it, but he is not at all, and he's in complete control. And you're one of his children, if you've heard from the heart, obeyed the gospel. Not many of them in the world, you know. Compared to the whole world, we're a small family. Look at the providence of God in Paul's life. Philippians 1, verse 12, he said to the brethren, But I would, ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me, have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel. I'm a bit amused when I read this and think about it and think of all that Paul went through. Because we pray for a lot of things that are right for us to pray for, that people obey the gospel, that the gospel have free course. We pray for certain people by name, our own brethren in the world, and that good will come as the Bible defines the good, the gospel spread. But I don't know that we realize sometimes what you may have to go through to get that prayer answered. And all you have to do is read about the life of Paul. And yet he could still say this, and my God shall supply every need of yours according to his riches. So we look at this and we think, does that apply to me? If it doesn't apply to me, it doesn't apply to anybody. I mean, as a member of the church of which we read about on the pages of the New Testament and to the faithful members of it. Let me go back to a miracle. I've said some of these things about providence, and they should be encouraging to us. That means God's can, God can answer prayer. I don't know how many thousands of members of the church there are, but he can answer each person's personal concerns in his <laughs> prayers. Let's look a little more and add to the definition I gave of a miracle earlier. A miracle 
and keep in mind what I've already said, is a space-time entity. It is wrought for a religious purpose. I'm simply adding to what I said earlier. It must have been an event produced by the immediate agency of God. It must have been an event resulting in the transcendence of the processes of nature. I think I said that earlier in different words. For the moment, by a force superior to nature. I've already mentioned Lazarus and his resurrection in John 11, 1 through 4, 46, I believe. When you think of Paul causing Elymas to go blind because he tried to come between Paul teaching <laughs> Sergius Paulus and him, Acts 13, 11, and caused him to go blind. Things like that. Now, when you read that in your Bible, does that do anything for you to make you a better person in serving God? Well, it ought to. Because that was done, as I said, in space and time. As we studied this morning, all the evidence we have coming today actually took place nearly 2,000 years ago. Well, the miracles that took place then are still today. Why should I deny them? The greatest miracle of all, the resurrection of Christ, as we talked about this morning. But these other miracles all fit the same way. A simple conclusion is this. Concerning providence, whether it's general and special, as we talk about it here, it's accomplished through or by means of God's natural laws. Now, who's behind the, who created them and who's behind them? Well, God is. So when I pray to God as a righteous person and pray an effectual, fervent prayer, he says it avails much with him. I don't really understand all of that because all of us are praying. We're all concerned about ourselves and others and our special, but he hears every one of them, and there's no mixing anything up. One doesn't collide with the other and nothing else like that. It's all done because God's not like us at all. He's not limited as we are. When... The kids were all little, and all four of them would sometimes start carrying on and chattering. You'd have to say, wait, 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 he's first. Well, God doesn't have to do that. We shouldn't think of him as a man. That gets a lot of folks into a lot of trouble thinking of God as a man. Let's remember this about, well, let's say healing. You realize that all healing is divine. But, but all healing is not miraculous. If you've got some malady and you go to the doctor and through his knowledge he diagnoses whatever it is and he's got it right. And he gives you whatever medicine it is or an injection or maybe you have to have that plus some or other treatment or whatever. Let's say it's antibiotic. That's the easiest to illustrate it with. You got an infection. The antibiotic kills the bacteria. The body heals itself. Where does the body get its power to heal itself? Well, who made it? with the power to heal itself. God did. So no matter what medical science discovers, when the body heals, it heals itself. But who put that into the body? You have an appendectomy, they remove the infected appendix, but the body heals itself. And on and on you can go. So we need to understand that all healing is divine, but to say that doesn't mean all healing is a miracle. A miracle sets aside or alters natural law. It causes a person to be able to see immediately when he 
was born blind and he's 40 years old. Or he's lame and never walks since he was born. And immediately he can walk and leap and praise God. Those are signs. And aren't they wonderful? And they confirm the message of the apostles and Jesus Christ himself to be the Son of God. Well, I would like to end emphasizing more the providence of God just now. You're not going to find a miracle. If you ask me for a miracle, let's open your Bible and read one. That's exactly what I'll tell you to do. But providentially, you may not be able to see it happening when it's happening, but I know it happens. Look how many years it took for God to do what he wanted to do with Joseph. All the things Joseph had to go through. Yet God's directing all of it. Think of Moses. Look what his parents had to go through. Putting him adrift on the Nile River. Sending his sister to watch to see what happens to him in that little ark. Bulrushes. Lo and behold, how did he get Pharaoh's daughter there at the time that that all comes to pass, that they could get together? And how did they know that she would take him into the household? And how was it with his sister there that when he sees her, Moses drawn out of the rushes, that she would be there to say, I know a nurse for him, his mother. And that's how he was learning about his own people, through her nursing him, and how he came to know who he was. Because when he grows to be an adult, as the scripture reveals, he knows. He knows who he is and who his real people are. Forty years old, prime of life, that would be the time you'd want to lead a bunch of people like that if anybody could ever want to lead, lead them anywhere. But no... He leaves all the royal power and majesty and learning of Egypt. And he goes 40 more long years into the desert where he now can be isolated and have time to think and to meditate. Then God appears to him the way he did. And now he's got 40 more years. Why, he's retirement age. <laughs> he ought to be ready to say, let's leave this to Joshua let him take them through the death. But he's, he's 80 years old at the time that he really gets down to what God wants him to do. And you know, he must have thought through all those 80 years, God's working this. He learned those things. He developed. He grew so that he would be able to do the things that he did in the 40 years of wandering. Now, when you read that, what does that say to you regarding your own service to God? I can bear it up. There's not a soul in this room that's worried about when you leave here being arrested because you were here worshiping God and put in jail or worse. Not, not any of us. It could come to that. It has come to that more than it hasn't over history. God will see us through. But here's our part. Seek ye first. Ask. Never stop. Seek. And never stop. Knock. And never stop. And Jesus says you do that and I promise you you'll find the truth. I guarantee it. And we can guarantee it to everybody too. He will see us through. God is an ultimate control and at the end of history it'll all come down just where he wants it regardless of all what seems like all through the ups and the downs and the rounds like when you think about Saul the apostle Paul and all he went through before he ever started on the first missionary journey as the apostle to the Gentiles many years were spent before he ever made the first missionary trip we just need to be prepared to do what we can where we are at the time. God will open the doors. But don't try to kick them open. 
He'll open the door that's for you if you will but dedicate totally and completely your life to him. God knows, God cares, and God can make it happen. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, we beg of you to have the kind of faith that causes you to understand what the Bible teaches on providence and miracles. And that you'll stay true to the book of God and whatever he charges you to do to be faithful to him and he will carry you through. That remind you of a song? He will carry you through. If you need to obey the gospel, we urge you to do that this afternoon. If as a child of God you've wavered, you've sinned, then we urge you to repent of those sins and pray God for forgiveness. Why not do that now while we stand and sing?